Hello everybody and welcome back. This is Peter Pronovost and today we're going to get into some of the really good details about what you could be doing towards eliminating central line associated bloodstream infections or what we'll call CLAPSI in your intensive care unit. The learning objectives for today are one for you to understand the model for translating evidence into practice, two to explore how to implement evidence-based behaviors that prevent CLAPSI, and three is to understand the strategies to engage, educate, execute, and evaluate whether these interventions have actually reduced catheter-related bloodstream infections. Remember that this work is deadly serious, that we, at the end of the day, have to be able to look this little girl's mother in the eye and tell her whether Indeed, care is safer in the intensive care unit, and these interventions will help us do that, at least for this one type of preventable harm, catheter-related bloodstream infections. Now, you may remember this is the scorecard that we've been working with to measure patient safety. And the intervention that we're going to do now is the conceptual model for how to put evidence into practice is designed to improve the top two measures. That is, how often do we harm, in this case, from bloodstream infections, and how often do we do what we should do? The model for translating evidence into practice, it was recently published in the British Medical Journal, has four key steps to it. And let's walk through them really briefly because they apply to any time you're trying to put evidence into practice. And the first step is that we ask you to summarize the evidence. Now, we've done the first three steps for you to a large extent. You do that by finding out what the evidence says we should do, picking the biggest interventions that have the best benefit and the lowest barriers to use, and then converting those interventions to behaviors. The output of this step, then, is a checklist of what we ought to be doing. The second step is to identify local barriers to implementing these interventions. And to do that, we ask you to do a number of things. These come straight out of Toyota production system. First is to observe staff performing the interventions. Second, to walk the process yourself. That is, try to see why is it hard to do this interventions. And then third, talk to your staff and your clinicians to find out from them in their own words, what's hard about doing this. Identify what they gain or lose from using this interventions. The third step is to measure performance. And you could either measure processes, that is, use of these interventions, or outcomes, in this case, bloodstream infections, or both. In this case, we're going to be measuring bloodstream infection rates. And then lastly, ensure that all patients receive the interventions. That is, make sure that you have a healthcare system that every patient gets this evidence all the time. And we ask you to do that with what we call the 4E model. And that is engage people, educate, execute, and evaluate. And let's go through those in more detail. We summarized this evidence for you. We took a 100-page guideline that was rigorous and well done by the Centers for Disease Control and called out from them five evidence-based behaviors that we should always do. Are they the right ones? Well, they've worked for us so far, but they're the, uh, the behaviors that have the strongest evidence and the lowest barriers to use. And they are remove unnecessary lines, wash your hands prior to the procedure, use maximal barrier precautions, clean the skin with chlorhexidine, a special soap, and avoid femoral lines. No high technology here, rather basic procedures that have had dramatic input. Now we want you to identify barriers to doing these things. So talk to their staff about, one, the knowledge of using these tools. Ask them, why is it difficult to do these behaviors? Walk the process of trying to place a catheter and observe your staff trying to place these catheters. When we look at barriers, they often fall into three buckets, or I try to put them into three buckets. And they are barriers that have to do with your clinicians. That is, 
do they have a knowledge deficit, they just aren't aware of the evidence, or they don't agree with the evidence. If they don't agree with it, you have to sit down and discuss it. This isn't something you're going to bully over people. Second, barriers that have to do with the intervention itself, and most of those are, it's ambiguous. Are staff really clear about what to do, when, how, with whom? So think about barriers relating to the staff, barriers related to the intervention, and lastly, barriers related to the system. That is, are all the equipment needed to do this there? Do you have a training program in place? Do you have appropriate supervision? What are those system barriers that you can use to make sure you put evidence into practice? Now that you've identified these barriers and hopefully targeted your interventions to address what are the most prominent barriers in your ICU, we want to make sure that patients reliably get the evidence that they're supposed to. We do that by walking through the four E's, and that is engaging people, educating, executing, and evaluating. And there's three groups of stakeholders that need to go through these four E's. They are your senior leaders, that is senior executives, team leaders, that is the unit directors and managers, and then all of your staff. And for engaging, what we've seen is if your staff can't answer how this project or this intervention makes the world better, you'll have no traction. Now, this may sound corny or coy to you, I assure you it's not. Your staff are uniformly committed to making care safer. And if they don't clearly understand how this project makes the world better, how it saves lives, how it prevents deaths of those little girl that we showed, you're not gonna have the commitment needed to do this hard work. We then need to educate on what exactly do they need to do. We then have to execute based on your barriers about what do I need to change in my system so that every patient gets this, these interventions every time they're supposed to, given the resources that I have and the culture that I have. And then finally, how do we know we actually improve safety? In this case, we'll be measuring bloodstream infections. So what are some ideas for ensuring patients actually receive this evidence? Well, you engage with stories stories of people who've been harmed in your hospital, and I'm sure there's plenty of them if you have the courage to tell them, and by looking at your baseline data. That is, looking at what your baseline rate of infections are and asking, is this, is this care you're proud of? Because we know from over 100 ICUs in Michigan that we could virtually eliminate these infections. And we, for far too long, have put these infections in what I call the inevitable bucket. That is, people get these infections because they're sick or they're old or they're very young. And what we found is that's just frankly not true, that most of them are preventable with some very basic things. What do you educate staff on? The evidence. So you saw the previous presentation on the evidence supporting these items on the checklist. Make sure your staff know the evidence. They know what they're supposed to do unambiguously to prevent these infections. Now that comes the hard part, though, is you have to execute. And execute meetings, creating a system that every patient gets these five things on the checklist all the time. How might you do that? Well, some suggestions. First, apply our principles of safe design. Standardize what you could do. One great way to standardize is to create a central line cart. Take all the equipment that you need to place a central line and put it in one place. Because what we found is that before we had this cart, gowns were stored in one place, masks were in another, caps were in another, half the time they weren't stocked. Our docs had to go to eight different places to get all the equipment. And predictably, some of it wasn't stocked and they would go without. And by going without, they exposed patients to risk. Now we store all the equipment we need in one cart. It's always available. We assign someone responsibility for stocking the cart and compliance has gone up, and you need to have the equivalent in your ICU. We need to create independent checks. In this case, take those five items that are the evidence for preventing catheters and put them in a checklist. We've gave you examples of the ones we've used. Use those or create your own. But then powerfully, make sure your nurses are empowered to stop takeoff. That is, nurses have to have a policy where they assist the placement of every central line 
and they are empowered that if these items on the checklist aren't done, they can go back and correct the defect. Now, when I say this, nurses roll off their chair and say, one, we don't have time to do that. And I would say you don't have time not to do that. You have to have nurses assisting on this position. It may just be they need to be there for the beginning. If these catheters take hours to place, they don't need to stay there the whole time necessarily, but they need to be there at the beginning when these mission critical steps happen. But more importantly, the nurses say, it's not my job to police the residents or the doctors placing these lines, and if I do, I get my head bit off. The doctors, on the other hand, said, Peter, you can't have a nurse second guess me in public. It makes me look like I don't know things. And what was striking about their responses was nobody debated the evidence. The evidence was pretty strong. What they debated was the power and the politics and the hierarchy. They didn't want to be shamed. And we can't blame them. None of us want to be shamed. So we pulled people together and said, is it possible that we harm patients in our hospital? You have to ask your staff the same. And if the answer is no, if the answer is that patients are your North Star, which I sure hope it is, and I have no doubt that it is, then nurses have to speak up. They have to stop the physicians if they don't do these things. Not because of power or politics, but because we have an obligation to create a healthcare system where every patient reliably receives the evidence that they're supposed to. You can see here why we link culture improvement efforts with translating evidence into practice because the two are inextricably linked. They have to go together because one without the other won't lead to the success that your patients are expecting. And then finally, make sure you have a mechanism to learn from your mistakes. And what do we mean by that? Well, that is every infection is reviewed. You make sure that the checklist was followed. You look whether the line cart was stocked and was available. Many times you scratch your head and you say, I don't know if there's something else we can do. I don't know if there's ways we could have prevented this. But the very act of thinking of that infection as always being in the preventable bucket rather than the inevitable bucket changes the culture, changes the mindset that these infections are indeed largely preventable, and we know that is so. And then finally, evaluate. You have to provide staff feedback of performance. In this case, it means quarterly rates of infections and weekly or monthly number of infections. Now, you can't feed back rates of infections weekly or monthly. There's just the numbers are too small and they're all over the place. But you could give just simply the number of people infected every month back to your staff. Indeed, in our ICUs, and I hope you do the same, we have a grid that's posted publicly to see of how many weeks since we've had an infection. And I would strongly encourage you to put those up in your ICU. In our toolkit, you'll see examples of how to make those. Now, this work can't be done alone. So to help with doing the four E's, we ask you to partner with your infection control staff, your hospital quality and safety leaders, your nurse educators, and your physician leaders. But fundamentally, it has to be the ICU staff who assume responsibility for reducing infections. The infection control staff and your hospital and quality safety leaders could help you educate, they could help you find barriers, they could help you collect and report data, but it has to be owned by the doctors and nurses who are doing these procedures. We talked about engaging an awful lot. The most powerful way to engage is sharing stories and posting your baseline rates of infections. You could also use the opportunity calculator where you estimate the number of deaths and the dollars spent from your current rates of infections. We'll have more about how you could access that in future sessions, but it's a really, really powerful tool. Educating, one great way to do this is do in-services to make sure staff truly understand what the evidence are that is supporting this checklist and that they know what their role in using the checklist are. Ideally, you create some forum to jointly educate doctors and nurses together because no longer could we afford to have nurse education and doc education for patient safety. That there's core knowledge that every clinician needs to know and they have to have it. 
You also need to add it to your orientation. And a simple way to do this is to make sure you give out a fact sheet. That is, you hand up to them what are the evidence supporting the items on our checklist. You can give them the original scientific articles if they want it, or these slides. The point is, you have to have multiple methods to educate your staff to make sure we meet them where they are and how they choose to be educated. To execute, standardize with creating a line cart, create the checklist, and you could use ours as a guideline or you can create your own. The point is all five of those key items, and you may add more, ought to be there. Many units have created checklists now for not just inserting a catheter, but for maintaining a catheter. So there's an audit and a checklist tool for maintaining them, and you'll hear more about that later. Make sure your nurses are empowered to work with physicians to stop takeoff. That is to stop the procedure if there's a breach in one of these items of the checklist. You have to have that degree of accountability if you're going to achieve the dramatic results that we achieved in Michigan. And you have to view every one of these infections as a defect that you can learn from. Again, they're not in the inevitable bucket. They're almost always in the preventable bucket. And you need to create a culture where you view these infections as preventable. You investigate them. You find out what went wrong. And you mitigate them. To evaluate these infections, you're going to be monitoring rates of infections using standardized definitions from the Centers for Disease Control. We'll provide you a standardized data collection tool to get these data in, to get monthly or weekly reports back of the number of infections and quarterly reports of the rates of infections. But one of the most powerful tools is for you to post in your ICU the number of weeks without an infection. And I strongly encourage you to make sure that that graph is up in each of your ICUs. So what's your action plan from this? What do you do with all this data? Well, hopefully you meet with your ICU team, your infection control staff, your hospital quality and safety leaders, your nurse educators, and your physician champions. You find out who's on your team and your team starts meeting weekly if you're not. You identify your barriers and you target interventions to address your main barriers. So if education isn't a barrier, or it is, you use that information to allocate your resources. If getting supplies stocked is a barrier, you address it. And then you use the 4E grid to develop a strategy on where you're most vulnerable to engage, to educate, to execute, and to evaluate. I would encourage you, though, not to shriek the responsibility of engaging people. Engaging is fundamental to making this stuff work. You know, we learned it used to just be a pastime activity. We knew it was important, but we didn't manage it as part of the work process. Unless you understand how this program saved lives, it won't happen. One really effective way for you to manage your work, it's a simple project management tool, is to make a weekly task list. That is each week, and it could serve as the agenda for your weekly team meetings. What are you going to accomplish this week for this project? And make sure you methodically, every week, knock off some items on that task list. Because at the end of the day, we have to look this little girl's mother in the face and tell her how we know she's less likely to die and in this project, we're going to do it by telling her what our infection rates, and we have to make work to make sure that we realize these goals. I have no doubt you can do it, but it has to start now, and it starts with you. So meet with your teams, make your plans, and let's get going. This is Peter Pronovost working with you to improve patient safety. Good luck.